pretend to my brother's fiance. Good afternoon, everybody. Today, the Vice President is in Memphis, Tennessee, to attend the celebration of life service for Tyree Nichols, White House officials including Senior Advisor for Public Engagement Keisha Lance Bottoms and Senior Advisor and Infrastructure Coordinator Mitch Landry are also in attendance on behalf of the administration. As you know, the President and the Vice President spoke to Mr. Nichols's mother and stepfather on the phone earlier to express their condolences and support. The President told Mr. Nichols' family that he would continue pushing Congress to send the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act to his desk. Last year, when, when Senate Republicans blocked that legislation from coming to his desk, President Biden took executive action, but as the President has said, there is no substitute to federal legislation. That's why tomorrow the President is hosting Representative Horse, Horsford and a small group of CBC members here at the White House for a conversation about the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act and other shared policies. And it's why he's continuing to call on Republicans in Congress to join with Democrats and ensure our justice system lives up to its name. I know you all just came back from the President's Competition Council meeting, so I wanted to highlight a few, uh, a few items that, uh, that has showed some progress we've made on the President's competition agenda. Today's Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, CFPB, rule would save consumers as much as $9 billion a year in excessive credit card late fees. The NTIA report today provides recommendations to give consumers more control over their devices. And the President is calling on Congress to pass a junk Fee Prevention Act, which would crack down on excessive concert and entertainment ticket fees, ban airline fees for families to sit with young children, eliminate exorbitant early termination fees for TV, phone, and internet service, ban surprise resort and destination fees at hotels, and also, more broadly, we are making progress limiting junk fees, which can cost hundreds of dollars a month. CFPB is targeting overdraft and bounce back fees, reducing those fees by more than $1 billion a year. And the Transportation Department led more airlines to guarantee coverage of hotels and meals when flights are delayed or canceled for issues under their control. Competition is a core tenet of the President's economic agenda to lower prices and promote capitalism. Now turning to another piece of news. During the North American Leaders Summit earlier this month, President Biden emphasized his commitment to working with Mexico to prosecute dangerous drug traffickers and increase information sharing on chemicals used in, in the illicit manufacturing of fentanyl and other synthetic drugs. Yesterday, the Treasury Department sanctioned leader of a Mexico-based network and two associates for procuring pr pr precursor chemicals from China to manufacture and traffic illicit fentanyl and other synthetic drugs to the United States. This action was coordinated closely with the government of Mexico and will play a role in disrupting the importation of chemicals to the United States, and we will continue to closely coordinate with Mexico our, and our regional partners to disrupt the transnational criminal organizations that are trafficking illicit fentanyl into the United States. And I wanted to end uh, our topper here by, mark, by marking the start of Black History Month, which we are celebrating today. Each February, National Black History Month serves as both a celebration and a powerful reminder that black history is an American history, black history is American culture, black, black stories are essential to the ongoing story of America. Yesterday, the President issued a proclamation in celebration of Black History Month. This month, the, the Biden-Harris administration is shining a light 
on black history by taking time to celebrate the immeasurable contributions of black Americans, honoring the legacies and achievements of generations past, reckoning with centuries of injustices and con confronting those injustices that are still so vividly in front of us today. President Biden and Vice President Harris are deeply committed to advancing equity, racial, racial justice, and opportunity for black Americans as this administration continues striving to realize America's founding promise. This administration's commitment began with building a federal government that looks like America. It continued with building a federal bench that reflects our nation. Nearly one-third of his judicial no appointments are black Americans, and President Biden has nominated more black women to federal courts than, ev than every other president in history combined. And of course, President Biden appointed J Kentaji, Justice Kentaji Brown Jackson, the first black woman to serve on our nation's highest court in the land. And in just two years, the Biden-Harris administration has delivered real and lasting change and continues to work each day to deliver equitable outcomes and opportunity for black Americans. Whether it's rebuilding the economy, where the unemployment rate for black Americans is a near record historic low at 5.7 percent, or providing nearly $6 billion in historic resources and support for historically black colleges and universities. But of course, even as we make meaningful progress, not a day goes by, and especially not this day today, without real reminders of how far we have left to go. The Biden administration will honor and continue the work of black Americans who have created a more fair and inclusive democracy, helping our nation move closer to realization of its full promise of opportunity and justice for all. With that, Song Min. Um, one, one question on a police reform. Can you talk about the president's message to the CDC members when he meets with them tomorrow and what new sort of strategy the White House has for getting police reform through Congress? And I ask that because one of the CDC members uh, told one of my colleagues today that the president is, quote, missing the opportunity to be a historic president when it comes to these issues and that he's been a champion of the status quo in many ways. We need to be, we need him to be as a champion of a new vision for America. So look, the president is very much looking forward to uh, meeting with congressional uh, um, uh, the members of the Congressional Black Caucus, uh, and to have a conversation, a real conversation about how to move forward on police reform and other shared policies, as I mentioned uh, moments ago. Uh, look, these are members that the President has had a long-standing relationship with, as you all know, and uh, it's, uh, it is a, a collaboration that we see uh, this, this conversation becoming, a collaboration again on dealing with an issue that uh, is truly affecting the black community and also the brown community as well. And, you know, to, to, your, to the statement that you just laid out from a congressional uh, uh, black caucus member, I would say this, you know, and I said this at the top, when, when the Senate Republicans blocked and would not move forward with the George Floyd uh, Policing Act, uh, the President acted. He acted by moving forward with an ex taking executive action. And that shows, uh, we believe, and the President believes, how important uh, this issue is. And by bringing the Congressional Black Caucus tomorrow to the White House, it also shows uh, the President's commitment uh, to working with Congress on trying to figure out how do we move forward. Again, it does not take away from the fact that the way that we're going to deal with this issue is to have federal legislation. That's how we're going to move forward. Again, the president took executive action. He was very proud that he was able to do that when the Senate, Senate Republicans in particular, blocked blocked what the what Democrats were trying to do, and he took action. And I think that shows his commitment. Um, and on documents, Ian addressed the version of this um, at the sticks a little bit ago, but I'm wondering how the White House can claim that they are being transparent when the FBI search of the Penn Center, Penn Biden Center, that happened months ago was not proactively disclosed to the public, and what should the public take away from the fact that you are keeping information like this from the public? Look, I'm going to be uh, very prudent from here. I'm going to be very consistent from here. Uh, I'm just not going to comment uh, anything that is related to what is currently happening. This is a legal process. As you just mentioned, my colleague was right outside these doors answering many of your questions. He has done that these past couple of weeks, I believe four weeks now, and he'll continue to do that. Uh, anything that is specific 
to this uh, to this particular process, I would refer you to the Department of Justice and uh, also, again, my colleagues at the White House Counsel's Office. Just following up on that, I understand you're not going to discuss the details or anything, but just is there a reason that two of the searches were disclosed and not the search of the Penn Biden Center? You mentioned this is a legal process. Is there a legal reason why you're disclosing only two and not what we know is a third search? I'm, again, I'm going to refer you to the White House Counsel's Office. Okay, then another question on the meeting today with uh, Speaker McCarthy. You know, given that the president has made it pretty clear he's not going to negotiate on the debt ceiling, uh, what does he hope to get out of this meeting? Look, the, we have said before uh, the president is looking forward to working uh, working closely and trying to figure out how he can deliver uh, with uh, with Republicans who are willing to work uh, in a you know in a good faith bipartisan way. He said that right after uh, the midterm elections, and uh, he's con he will continue uh, to make that effort. And you know the president has been very clear about this. He wants to. They're going to talk about a range of issues, as you've heard me say, as you've heard us uh, really report out uh, from how we see. The this, uh, this meeting moving forward. And look, he wants to hear from uh, the speaker, what's his plan? What is his plan on the budget? What is his plan to really uh, deal with, uh, uh, to deal with, um, uh, to deal with what is at the top of the minds of the American people? How are we going to lower costs for them? How are we going to deal with uh, the national uh, deficit, which is something that the president has taken very seriously by, in record, in record fashion, lowering uh, the deficit by 1.7 billion dollars? He wants to talk about that. He's always willing to have those conversations in good faith. Uh, and also, he wants to see what their budget is. What is their plan? We've heard them over and over again talk about cutting Medicare, cutting uh, Social Security. This is what we have heard from Republicans leading up to the midterms and then after the midterms. So, okay, what what is what else are they going to be doing? What does that look like uh, to, for, for them? And the president did have some choice words for the speaker last night ahead of this meeting. He says he's made off-the-wall commitments to the far right. Uh, was there any strategy? In, in saying that ahead of this meeting, uh, is he trying to throw him off a little bit, or on the flip side, you know, is that really well, helpful to be I, talking like that? I, I will say this: like we understand what the speaker is going through. He has a caucus uh, that uh, you know that has put forth some pretty extreme ideas some extreme uh, options in front of the American people, cutting Medicare, cutting social security. As it relates to the budget and dealing with uh, issues that truly matter for the American people. Uh, Kareem, what is the current number of documents bearing classified markings that have been found in the president's residences and offices? I would refer you to the White House Counsel's Office. Oh, Ian just declined to comment on that as well. Just, um, there you uh, go. On, answer. On, on debt, um, would the president veto a uh, bipartisan bill that included both spending cuts and a debt limit hike uh, similar to the 2011. So I'm not going to get, I'm certainly not going to, uh, well, I'm glad you, you mentioned 2011 because I know I, there's been a lot of reporting on that. And I just want to be very clear. In 2011, the Obama-Biden uh, administration negotiated in good faith uh, but congressional Republicans' recklessness, recklessness caused a historic blow to our economy. That's what we saw in 2011. And that's why when you look at how the administration, the Obama-Biden administration moved forward in 20, 2013 and 2014 and 2015, they moved forward in a way to avoid uh, unnecessary danger. They didn't do that in, in, those, three, in those three consecutive years uh, because of the bad faith that they saw in 2011. And so, uh, look, Let's not forget, that's why congressional Democrats and Republican in, in Congress voted three times in the Trump administration to lift the, the debt ceiling. And let's not forget, this has happened 78 times since 1960, 49 times under Republican presidents and 29 times under uh, Democratic presidents. So uh, this has been done before. It's their constitutional obligation to do this. And uh, we are talking about programs when they talk about Medicare and Social Security. We're talking talking about programs that they want to take hostage, that's going to affect taxpayers, that's going to affect seniors, that's going to affect veterans. And uh, um, again, it is their constitutional duty. They should be able to do this without conditions. Thanks, Green. I'm um, trying to address some market-related chatter as well as some of the beliefs of some members on Capitol Hill. Jay Powell was just asked about the debt ceiling. He said there's only one option here. It's for Congress to pass the increase. 
is that the view of the White House? There is only one option. There are no prioritization op off ramps, comically large coins to consider anything like that. Congress is the only option here in the view of the White so House. So on any of the coins and mint coins, I know that's come up before, you know, that's something that the Treasury deals with and, and answers on, so I'm not going to comment there. I think we've been very clear. I think we've been very clear from here that this should be done without conditions. And um, it is it is their basic job, Congress, right? It is their basic ju duty to lift the debt ceiling. It is something that has been consistently done over the years. And that's how we see it. We see it as is something that should not be done without condi with, with conditions. It should be done without conditions, to be even clearer. And again, it is their constitutional obligation to get this done for the, on behalf of the American people. I understand that. And you guys have made that abundantly clear repeatedly. I'm saying, are you closing, can you close the door on any other alternatives than Congress fulfilling their constitutional obligation? Look, what I'm saying is we've been very clear about when we've been asked if there's going to be negotiate, if there's room for negotiations, we have said this should be done without uh, any conditions. We should, there shouldn't be a way to go around this to get this done. This is something that Congress should act on. Now, and I've mentioned this a little bit, which is as it relates to, uh, you know, lowering the deficit and that being a top priority for this president and has been throughout the last two years, he is willing and happy to have a good faith conversation with anybody who wants to talk to him about ways to do that. And that's why he's been able to, in the last two years, we've talked about it, I just mentioned it, in record fashion, $1.7 uh, trillion, which is the largest decline in American history. That's what the president has been able to do. Now, as it relates to uh, the debt ceiling, that is a separate matter. That is a different different matter. We see this as a constitutional obligation that they, that they have, uh, that Congress has, to act. Just one more. Um, the Department of Interior advanced uh, uh, an $8 billion oil drilling project earlier today. Um, climate advocates uh, had pretty sharp criticism of that. Does the President believe he is adequately balancing his climate goals with the need for increased oil production in the near term? So let me just be clear. Uh, no decision has been made on this. Uh, so. Now, if you're asking about the president's commitment to tackling climate crisis, as I think you were just saying, uh, the president has done more uh, than any other president uh, on this front. And uh, he's taken bold executive actions to accelerate clean energy manufacturing. He's secured historic legislation to make communities more resilient to the impacts of climate change and lower energy costs and so much more. And he continues to del deliver on historic climate change action while carrying out the law and meeting our energy needs. Again, no decision has been made yet. This is something, uh, as it relates to this particular uh, project, the final decision is going to be made by the Secretary of, of the Interior. Uh, but this is a president that has been committed to climate change, and, and, uh, and uh, you see that, again, in his actions. Uh, thank you. Um, you were mentioning police reform, how uh, the president has said that he wants legislative action. It doesn't seem like there's more momentum at this point uh, for the George Floyd bill. Is there anything being considered as far as executive action? I realize he signed the order last summer, but anything additional as far as executive action? Well, let me let me just say a couple of things here, because I think people uh, forget what the uh, executive action did and uh, that the president took. Again, he took these the, he took this step when when uh, Senate Republicans blocked uh, the George Floyd uh, 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 Policing Act and would not move forward with something that's incredibly important. So it, if you look at the executive action, it resulted in immediate changes like mandate, mandating stricter use of force standards and body-worn cameras, it, banning, uh, it banned chokeholds and restricting no-knock warrants at the federal level. It set the new standard for effective, accountable policing at the federal, at the federal level as well. It also incentivize, incentivizes uh, reform at the state and local level through grant-making and accred accreditation standards. But again, we understand there's a lot more work to do, and the way that we're seeing this, the way that the president sees this, in order to have long-lasting change, we have to have federal legislation. That is the way that we're going to be able uh, to see real uh, a real difference in communities as it relates to uh, police reform. And that's why uh, he's having the caucus here. He's going to have those conversations and see uh, how how we can move forward. There were some things that were revised in that um, in that order compared to earlier draft orders. There were on use of force. It 
had originally said that uh, officers would only be able to use deadly force as a last resort. That was changed to when necessary as well. So it did revise, but there were additional things that some criminal justice advocates were, were calling for as well. So is there anything additionally, noting what's in there, that's being considered in case we don't see Congress move? So again, we, the president, has taken this very seriously by putting forward an executive action. As you just laid out, we talked, we went back and forth and talked about what was in the executive action. But he truly believes in order to make real reform here, we have to get Congress to act. And we, uh, this is a president that has been told many times, you cannot get this done, you cannot get that done, and we have, you know. And if you look at the last two years, you know, I think more than 250 pieces of legislation that became into law were bipartisan. Uh, some of the most important historical pieces of legislation that it's going to uh, really uh, help Americans as we talk about the economy, as we talk about not leaving anybody behind, was done in a bipartisan way. You think about the bipartisan infrastructure legislation, right? For example, you think about the Chips and Science Act that's bringing back manufacturing, uh, manufacturing back into the into the U.S. Those are important steps that was led uh, by this president. So again, it's not going to stop him just because we're, uh, we may be hearing naysayers or people are saying that we're not going to get this done. Yeah, of mean? the new era of divided government, when there were Republican oversight hearings being held today into the administration's border security and pandemic policy, the president's meeting with the speaker. Can you remind us, what is the level of cooperation or uh, legitimate uh, back and forth you're willing to have with a Republican-led House when they're holding these investigations? Say that, say, say it a little bit more so I well, understand. Well, okay, border security yeah. policy is one thing, pandemic policy, how money was spent is another. Uh, what, what does the White House consider to be the kind of oversight and inquiries from congressional committees that you're willing to engage in and what is not? So look, as it relates to the Oversight Committee, and I've said this many times before, look, we are willing to work with Republicans, House Republicans, on important priorities that matter to the American people, like lowering uh, lowering uh, costs for, for Americans, as they said was really important going into the midterm elections. That's what we want to focus on. We want to focus on the priorities that matter to the American people. We're not interested in engaging in political stunts, uh, and uh, we want to move past the constant political warfare, as we continue to see uh, from Republicans, sadly. And again, let's not forget, when uh, Americans went out to vote for, in the midterms, they said they wanted to see less of that. They actually wanted to see bipartisanship. Uh, as it relates to uh, any specifics to the Oversight uh, Committee, I would refer you to my colleagues at the White House Counsel's Office. There was a local news report that various versions of the so-called beast that the President <laughs> is driven around in don't include the taxation without representation license plates that Presidents Bill Clinton and Barack Obama used and Presidents Bush and Trump did not. Is there any reason for that or does the President plan to part, yeah, start using I, them on the beach? So I saw, I saw some of those, uh, some of that reporting you have like, you, I know you have a look, you just looked over at Mary, Mary looked over to you and I don't know what's happening. Um, but uh, look, I have to run down, that down uh, as to uh, the beast and, and why it may not have those plates. But what I can tell you, and the president has been very consistent since the campaign, that we strong, strongly support the D.C. statehood, and, uh, and that has not changed. But I'll run that down to see about the, certain, the plates on the beast. And January came and went, and there was no physical for the president. Is there a plan for that? That is a very good question. I'm glad you asked it. Uh, so um, just to answer that question for you, the president will, uh, physical will be completed completed February 16th and released publicly in the same manner as it was back in 2021. So we have a date for you. We wanted to make sure we had a date for you. Uh, <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, and just to just to give you a little bit more of information, I know folks were wondering why it hasn't happened yet. This was literally a matter of scheduling around what has been an incredibly uh, busy uh, busy schedule for the president the past several months, uh, evolving schedule, travel schedule in recent weeks, as you all have seen for yourself. But we have a date in the books, and so wanted to share that with all of you. Thank you. Okay.
Thank you. Uh, I wanted to ask you about the India-US initiative of critical and emergence technologies which were uh, launched yesterday. Uh, NSS Sullivan said that uh, it is the next big step in the relationship. And he also said that this is an initiative led by President himself. Can you let us know uh, what this President thinks about it, why he's launching the initiative, and why this is called the big, next big thing in this relationship? So as you know, the President and, uh, and the Prime Minister, Prime Minister Modi, uh, announced announced this initiative back when they met in a meeting in uh, May of just last year, 2022, and that was in Tokyo, as you all know, and directed their national security advisors to spearhead our partnership in critical uh, emerging technologies. And the president believes this initiative that you just laid out is key for the U.S. and India to create a democratic uh, technology ecosystem and reinforces our democratic values and our democratic institutions. So we see this as an incredibly important initiative and a partnership that we have uh, with India. We made our announcements yesterday in uh, in defensive innovation, semiconductors, space, 5G, and STEM talent, and we look forward to, to building on this momentum in the upcoming months and years. So again, a, an important partnership and initiative uh, between uh, the two uh, the two uh, friends, who are two, two countries. Who are Is it also friends. aimed towards China? So look, I mean, you can't ignore the geopolitical uh, context that we live in, as you asked me about China, but this initiative is not about one, any country or one country. It truly is about uh, something bigger than that, a relationship between uh, two friends, two countries who have been uh, partners uh, for some time. So uh, look, as two, two of the world's uh, leading economies and democracies, it, it is in our interest to strengthen this partnership and deliver for our people, and, and when you think about the economies and the people around the world. So we think it, this is an important step forward and we'll continue to grow on this invasion, in, uh, initiative. Thank you. Um, one more on the uh, deficit reduction talks as it relates to the debt limit. So it is the position of the White House that you don't want to negotiate obviously on the debt limit. That needs to happen. You say Congress needs to do that without conditions. So would that mean that any bipartisan proposal that the President agreed to as it relates to deficit reduction or debt reduction would have to happen after Congress raised the debt limit? Well, I mean, I guess I'm just trying to figure yeah. out sort of the, the, the process here, like what's step one and what's step two. And, and I don't think there's just one step. And the step is they need to live up to their congressional obligation. That's their constitutional obligation, to be even more specific, uh, which is lifting uh, the debt ceiling, something that was done three times under the last president. And I've mentioned the number 78 many times because it's happened 78 times since 1960s, 49 times under a uh, Republican president, 29 times under a Democratic president. This is something that the Speaker himself voted on three times in the last administration. So there's only one step here, and the one step is to do this without conditions. But the president has said, and you have said from this podium, that he is open to these negotiations and, and potential legislation right on deficit and debt, right? When so we're talking about the national deficit, when we're talking about lowering that, the president is willing to have a good faith conversation, which is something that he's prioritized, right? We've we mentioned the $1.7 billion that he was able to lower the deficit and because of the po economic policies that he's moved, fo moved forward with. So he takes that very, very seriously. Now, if they want to have a good faith conversation about that, he's willing to listen. But right now, all we have heard from the Republicans, the Republicans in the House, to be very specific, the extreme Republicans in the House, to be even more specific, is that they want to cut Medicare, they want to cut Social Security, hold that hostage, which is something that should not be done. It would lead us into chaos. So it's not, it's, it's, it is a, a, a direction that we think is wrong, uh, a direction that is not, should not be taken. Uh, we think that when it comes to the lifting the debt ceiling, it should be done without conditions. All right, I'll come back to you. Can I ask you about police reform really quickly again? To follow up on some questions you received, Karine. Thanks. Uh, Senator Graham is voting the comp uh, a compromise idea that would keep qualified immunity for officers but would get rid of those protections for police departments. Would the president support a compromise of that kind? So I haven't seen that uh, uh, that um, uh, piece of legislation. Who certainly would have to uh, uh, go get go back to uh, our policy team to talk through that uh, legislation from Senator Graham. What I will say, though, is uh, the president wants to see uh, action in a bipartisan way. Uh, 
in Congress to deal with an issue that's clearly critical. As we're watching what's happening today, we're watching a family bury a loved one. And we believe, he believes, the way that we're going to make transformational change on this issue is to uh, have uh, legislation. I don't want to speak to something that I have not spoken to the team yet. It's possible the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act it doesn't have to come in the version that it pre-existed in, right? You guys are open to some changes to that? Is that a yes? I mean, look, if it's in a bipartisan way, if it's Republicans joining Democrats in a real way to ch to ha bring forth transformational change, uh, we are willing to have that conversation. Look, tomorrow's caucus is going to be very important as well. And uh, we're going to talk to the CBC members and talk through what their, what their ideas are and what they're thinking. But again, we think that legislation, federal legislation, is the way to move forward here. A separate question. I asked this of Ian Sams outside when he um, took our questions earlier. I want to ask of you, though, because I think it is for the wider White House, not just the special counsel's office, which is, did anyone at the White House tell the National Archives at any point not to issue a press release about the discovery of classified documents? I would, I would really refer you to the White House counsel's office, who has been running this process, right. and refer you even to them. It, even if it's something that's not just in their purview, it would be wider within the I, entire I White House? Because this is, when it, re when it relates to the DOJ, when it relates to special counsel, this is something that's been under their pre, uh, purview, so I would refer you to them. Thanks, Crane. Um, on the uh, show up to work uh, telework bill, um, I wanted to see if you could tell us um, what the White House's position is on that piece of legislation. It seeks to end telework for federal workers um, so they'll go back to work in downtowns, um, and whether or not President Biden would veto it should it pass. So a couple of things, um, I just want to take a little bit of a step back and and kind of take us back to when the president first walked into this administration. And what he had to do and was able to do was really do a whole of government uh, 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 process in dealing with uh, COVID and what we saw at the time. And uh, he put forth a comprehensive, uh, uh, a comprehensive way to deal with uh, making sure that people got their shots in arms, right? Making sure that uh, what we saw uh, with schools being closed, small businesses being closed, he was able to to move forward with the American Rescue Plan, which was only uh, voted out of uh, out of Congress by Democrats. And what we were able to do is open the country, reopen the country. Uh, small businesses are booming, as we saw a record uh, a record number of small business applications. That we, which we announced about two weeks ago. And now uh, COVID-19 does not determine how federal agencies work and serve the public because of the work that this president did on day one. And so our view is that the agency decisions should be guided by a, a focus on delivering results for the American people. That's how uh, they should move forward, like other major employers and federal agencies are making those decisions based on their uh, performance goals, not only to increase efficiency and effectiveness, but also to remain competitive in the labor market. So we're committed to working with anyone in Congress to, to continue strengthening federal agencies. We think that's incredibly important. And the federal workforce in order to deliver on, on their missions and serve the American public. That That's what we think the criteria should be. Uh, look, uh, you know, we've explained our thinking, uh, how the president sees this, and uh, don't have anything to share specifically on the, the Show Up Act. But we believe that, uh, you know, there are ways that uh, federal agencies should be able to track their performance and continue to uh, continue to deliver for the American people. And that's how uh, we think this is the most important way to move forward here. Yes, particularly given that the administration announced it's going to be ending the state of emergency on COVID, that there would be a desire to get federal workers back in the office. I just don't have anything specific. It's on, on, on that particular question. We, again, think it's, it should be, that decision should be guided uh, by agency, that that's their decision to make. On one other topic, um, on Russia, um, does the Biden administration believe that Russian and Belarusian athletes should be able to compete in the Olympic Games in Paris in 2024. So um, I haven't talked to the to my to my colleagues at NSC. Would like to get a sense of where they are. Have not uh, heard any real like imp imp reporting or had any incoming. So let me just talk to them and see where we are with okay, that. We can circle back. Okay. Thanks, Kareem. A couple of weeks ago, when the mayors were in town, the president said he looked forward to an honest debate with Republicans on entitlements. Uh, the House Speaker on Sunday on Face the Nation was asked if he uh, was going to propose cuts to Medicare and Social Security, and he said no. He said he would take that off the table. He was asked. 
completely? And he said, yeah. So is it your sense, is it the sense here that the House Speaker's not being honest when he says that? I, I think it's more of like, there are some facts out there, right, that we can easily point to, like this administration can point to. And I think I did a little bit of that last time. Uh, and so if you look at uh, McCarthy's Republican conference, especially the extreme part of, the, of that conference, uh, and, and McCarthy himself voted to raise the retirement age and, and Medicare as we know it. That has been historic. Like that is, those are the facts. Uh, and just last year, the Republican Study Committee, which includes most House Republicans, reiterated those calls to cut Social Security and Medicare. Uh, when Republicans call for these cuts, they do so under the guise of strengthening the programs. So, you know, when when the Speaker Speaker McCarthy uh, says he wants to strengthen Social Security or Medicare, but rules out making the wealthy and the big corporations pay their fair share, so that leaves just to one option, which is cuts. And again, many uh, many outlets in here reported what what House Republicans were thinking about when it came to this new Congress, the new 118th Congress. Uh, Fox News says Republicans eye using debt limit hike to overhaul entitlement programs if entrusted with majority. That's something that was reported on CBS. Republicans want to push Social Security, Medicare eligibility age to 70, as I just mentioned, voting to increase the, the age limit. Reuters, GOP House members are threatening to force cuts to Medicare and Social Security spending. I mean, these are the facts. This is from the reporting that we all saw from you, but not you guys got that reporting because of what you saw, the actions were being taken by House Republicans. Washington Post, House GOP I Social Security, Medicare amid spending battle. So this is something that they have said over and over again for the past several months. And there is also uh, voting that could be looked at on how they have treated this issue of Medicare and Social Security. So they've been very vocal. Uh, and uh, they've been very clear. And so what we're going to do is we're going to stand up for the American people, fight for the American people, and protect Medicare and Social Security, which the president has said himself and been very clear about. Setting entitlements aside for a moment, one of the other things that Republicans are saying is that there ought to be a reduction in discretionary spending. Uh, is that something the president is in any way open to, or will he put forward a budget on March 9th that increases discretionary So I'm not going to get into get ahead of the president, right? As you saw from our memo yesterday, the president's going to have his budget on March 9th. Uh, he is calling and asking, right, the speaker to put forward his budget as well so the American people can see uh, what it is that they're thinking about, what it is that they're uh, thinking about when it comes to the American people and the budget, right? What what are the cuts that they want to make? What is it that they're proposing? Uh, so certainly not going to get ahead of what the president's going to put out on March 9th. If I just could, just because I know it's important to everyone here and important to the public as well, can you explain the decision not to offer the public visibility on this meeting? It's it's tradition for the press to be brought in when the president speaks to the speaker. Not, I'm, look, not all the time. The president has had many conversations, one-on-one -on -one conversations with member of Congress. Totally understand. I get the question and understand uh, why there is interest in this. But we have done it many times before where we've had private one-on-one -on -one, uh, meetings with members of Congress. And not just in this uh, administration. We've seen it under President Trump. We've seen it under uh, President Obama. And I know the, the big four uh, was, uh, uh, was there was a pool spray for that one. But it was the big four. It was a different kind of a different meeting, but it's not uncommon. It is not uncommon to have one -on -one, private one-on-one -on -one meetings. And I'll, I'll just add to this, you know, Speaker Speaker uh, McCarthy is, is welcome to go to the sticks uh, after the meeting and take your questions. We, we welcome that if that is something that he wishes to do. Uh, can you uh, help us just clarify what his position then a little more is on deficit reduction? Like you're saying, McCarthy, hey, give us your plan. Uh, is your plan, the president has sort of let out drips and drabs of his views here and there. So just so I understand correctly, he is opposed to any cuts to Medicare and Social Security, including changes to eligibility. He's open to other spending reductions over the medium term, including potentially defense? Uh, I want to be very careful here, because what the president has been very clear about is what is their plan? He wants to see their plan as it relates to the budget, right? The, so the president is going to put out his budget on March 9th. You guys will all get to see that. Uh, and so we want to see what their plan is. Uh, I'm not going to, to get ahead of that particular piece when it comes to uh, the budget. But of course the president's going to protect the Medicare, right, uh, for Americans. Of course the president's going to do everything that he can to protect Social Security. And when it comes to holding those two programs hostage, the president's going to call that out and say that we should not be holding those two uh, those two programs hostage 
on, on something that is the basic duty of Congress, which is to lift the debt ceiling, something that they should be able to do because it is their constitutional duty. Mike, you're trying to put the debt ceiling aside, and I, I hear you. Does he want a fiscal reform deal aside from that? Like, does the president want a deal? Well, he wants himself? to see what what is their what is what are they putting forth? Uh, what is their I idea of uh, dealing with the with fiscal right fiscal uh, priorities? What does that look like for them? So. That's what he's going to ask them for, which is what we did in, in our memo yesterday. He wants to see what is it that they're putting forward. Right, and I'm trying to ask what it is you're putting forward. Is this like revenue is part of that mix well, as well? Will we talk I, to Kevin McCarthy about, hey, these are the taxes we uh, want. We, 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 we want to see, we have been very clear when it comes to Medicare, when it comes to Social Security, right? That should be protected. We're going to continue to fight for that. And we've been very clear when it comes to the debt limit, it should be done without conditions. We've been very clear. And we should not hold those two programs and others, not just that, hostage. Right? Been very, very clear about that. On March 9th, the President's going to put forth his budget. You're going to see uh, how he sees uh, the budget moving forward in this uh, in this uh, fiscal year. And, uh, and so I'll leave it there. And then, again, as I said in the memo, you guys read it uh, from Brian Deese and others, uh, that we want to see what their plan is. And with the public health emergency, just to be clear, is it the administration's plan to lift Title 42 on May 11th when the public health emergency underpinning it is lifted? So, I, look, I just want to be very clear on this part, too, because I know this question has come up, and I do want to do a little bit of a step back here. The CDC said in April that the Title 42 uh, should lift, but the courts have, as you all know, uh, required us to keep it in place. And so that's kind of where we are. Uh, so we do not know when or what uh, the courts will rule, uh, but we, we must comply with that order. And so we're going to comply with that. Uh, as it relates to what exactly is going to happen, because it is a court matter, a court order, that is something that DOJ is dealing with at this time. Even if you lift the emergency, if the court order hasn't been lifted, you're going to keep 42 in place? And so here's what we were trying to do, and I'll be uh, explain like our thinking here. Uh, so what House Republicans were trying to do is they were trying to really barrel toward uh, abruptly and immediately ending Title 42. And what we are trying to do uh, was to make sure that there was an orderly process to manage this in a in a really uh, it managed the situation at the border in a way that was, uh, again, orderly and effective. And what they wanted to do is to end something overnight, which would have created chaos. And so that's why we, uh, we have been very clear about doing this when it comes to Title 42, doing this in a safe and orderly way. And, uh, and coming up, uh, you know, we are putting up, uh, we're putting forward alternative priorities, alternative ways to dealing with the border. And so that's why we moved in that way. That's why we were very clear about, uh, about what we're trying to do these next couple of months. Now, as you're asking me about the date, if it's going to happen or not on that particular date, again, there's a court order in place uh, that, uh, as you know, that was, uh, that was very clear that DOJ is taking on. And so I would for refer you to DOJ about what will happen because of that court order. Thank you so much. Two domestic questions today. First of all, when the President meets with Speaker McCarthy, what are the specific areas of bipartisan cooperation that he's going to focus on, um, aside from, you know, the, the debt ceiling? So uh, there's going to be a range of issues that they're going to discuss. You'll hear from the President afterwards. We'll have a, you know, a readout of the meeting. You'll probably hear from the Speaker if, he's, if he is uh, going to go to the sticks. You guys can all ask him questions. Don't want to get ahead of a meeting that is probably underway, I, I believe, uh, and uh, just don't want to get ahead of it. But again, there'll be a range of issues that the president thinks is important to work uh, with, uh, with, uh, with Congress on, uh, with the speaker on, uh, but just don't want to get ahead of what is going to be discussed specifically. Zooming out on the Tyree Nichols funeral today, uh, people both inside the United States and outside are looking at this killing and asking, is the United States a racist society? I'd like to hear your thought on that and also what the administration is doing beyond just police reform, qualified immunity, those discussions, what the U.S. is doing holistically, what the administration is doing holistically to address that perception. So at the top of the briefing, you heard me lay out uh, how important this month is because it's Black History Month uh, and how important 
uh, it is to see black Americans uh, and lifting up the contribution of black Americans and also uh, understanding that their culture, uh, when you think about black culture as American, is also American culture. Uh, when you think about uh, what they've been able to, uh, what the black community has been able to contribute to the history of this country, uh, what we, they've been able to contribute in many different sectors uh, of, uh, of America. And so that's something that's really important that we will continue to lift up. There was a uh, memorandum that was put out by the president. <laughs> and look, you know, when the president walked into this administration, he said there were four crises that we were needed to deal with. One of them was COVID, one of them was the economy, uh, climate change, and he talked about racial injustice. Uh, and he had he had given many, he has given many, uh, many speeches on the work that we still need to do to deal with an issue uh, that is affecting a community, across, communities across the country, this particular community, the black community. So we understand, he understands there's a lot more work to be done and we need to call out injustices and continue to do that. Uh, and uh, while we have a rich history and an important history in this country, uh, there are things that he b also believes is important that we talk about and we speak to, and that is the injustices that we have seen in the black community and other communities as well, uh, historically. So that's why the president has made it a priority in his administration to make sure that it looks like America, to make sure that we see the diversity uh, in this administration uh, throughout different communities. And you see that over and over again when you look at the different agencies, when you look into the White House. And this is, this is uh, historically the most diverse uh, administration in history. And that matters. When we talk about policies, when we're talking about transformational change, when we talk about uh, how do we move forward in a country uh, that is dealing with many issues, that's important to, to see that and to have that at the federal government. So again, lots more work to be done. Uh, the president understands that. He's spoken to that. And uh, we're going to hopefully be able to, uh, uh, to work towards uh, the healing uh, for this country. Thank you, Karine. I have two questions on uh, debt and deficit. First, the budget that the White House proposed last year represented 102 percent of the country's economic output. Is the administration aiming for something below that this year? I'm just not going to get ahead of the president's uh, uh, budget that's coming out on March 9th. You'll, you'll be able to view that once he's ready to speak to it. But directionally, where are discussions going? I, I hear you. I hear you're asking me for direction. You're asking me what is it potentially going to look like, the ballpark number. I'm just not going to get ahead of the president. And then on the debt itself, you said earlier that the difference between 2011 and now is the number of times that Republicans have been able to pass the debt limit on a clean basis without anything attached to it. But the other difference is that the national debt has more than doubled in that time. It now is about $240,000 per household. Does the president believe that that is sustainable? Well, let's, let's, let's remember why we have seen that the last couple of years, right? I mean, we have seen that uh, the, the, it balloon in the way that you just spoke to. Let's not forget the Trump tax cut, the $2 trillion 2017 Trump tax cut. Uh, if you think about that, if you think about the first piece of legislation that Republicans put forward was going to increase uh, the debt limit by $100 billion. Uh, and so there's been time after time that we have seen uh, you know, uh, 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 action uh, that has been uh, incredibly, uh, you know, not not uh, prudent to what we need to be doing in moving the country forward. The deficit increased every single year under Trump. His four years in office are responsible for 25 percent of to of our total national debt from the last 230 plus years. Uh, and so, look, there's been action that's been taken uh, by, uh, by Republicans in Congress uh, that has led to where we are today. Uh, again, their first piece of legislation just weeks ago in this new Congress would have, uh, would have uh, increased the deficit by $100 billion. And let's, not forget, uh, and let's not forget why, to help tax cheats, wealthy tax cheats. That's what they wanted to do. This is a president for the first two years has taken lowering the deficit very seriously and has done it in a historic fashion. Will this administration pledge to be deficit neutral? this year? Look, what I can say is the president is committed to dealing with lowering the deficit. He, he has a record uh, to, to speak to, as I just mentioned, the $1.7 billion that he has been able to do in the first two years to lower uh, the deficit. And he is willing, willing to have a good faith conversation 
right, with, uh, with, with anybody, Democrats, independents, Republicans, to talk about how do we continue to move forward to do that, to deliver uh, a, a, uh, for the American people, yes, on important programs and issues, but also how are we going to continue to lower the deficit, which he thinks is incredibly important. Thanks, Karen. Uh, Tyree Nichols' parents are expected to come to the State of the Union next week as a guest of the member of Congress. Uh, is, would the president meet with them when they're here in town next week? So, don't have a don't have a meeting to preview at this time, as you know. Just last week, last Friday, the president spoke with uh, his uh, his mother and his stepfather, offering his condolences. Um, and saying that, uh, telling telling them that he is going to continue to fight uh, for police reform, continue to fight for the George Floyd uh, Policing Act, and so that is a commitment that he's made to the family. Don't have a don't have a meeting to to read out or or to announce at this time. And on the COVID uh, pandemic emergency, the administration has been using that as the justification for the plan to cancel student loan debt. Does ending the COVID emergency undermine the student loan plan? So we see that uh, very very differently. Um, as uh, as we've, we've talked about before, I think I've been asked this question before. Um, so we're not using any emergency power. Uh, we're using the HEROES Act, as I've mentioned before, which gives the Secretary of Education the explicit authority to provide debt relief in this exact situation. So as you know, millions of Americans are, are at risk to default on their student loans due to the economic effects of the national emergency. And so this is why we took this action, to make sure that uh, tens of millions of Americans Americans are able uh, to uh, to deal with the time that was very difficult, especially in the last couple of years. So the Secretary of Education is using the authority Congress gave them uh, to prevent the harm. And so that's been the important uh, priority of the president to make sure that the folks who uh, who felt the who felt um, who felt the pinch, if you will, who felt um, uh, the hurt the most uh, these past couple of years due to uh, what COVID did to the economy, got a little extra help. Thanks, Green. With regards to the State of the Union, will that be paired with additional travel? And more broadly, can you tell us anything more about what the president wants to accomplish legislatively over the next year, given the intense congressional gridlock? So, look on on the first question. We'll have more to share uh, on what uh, what that week will look like for the president. Uh, again, don't want to get ahead of uh, of any announcement from here. Um, as far as legislatively, look, the president has been very clear uh, after, again, after the midterms, and this is a president who's talked about uh, throughout his career working a bipartisan way uh, with Congress on delivering import in important programs and important initiatives for the American people. That is something that he's going to continue to do, and it won't stop him. Uh, he's done that the first two years. I talked about 250 plus uh, pieces of legislation that's become law that the president signed. Uh, so clearly that's something that the president is committed to. Uh, you, you know, he's going to have this conversation with Speaker McCarthy, just like he's had a conversation last week with the Democratic leaders. And uh, they're going to try to figure out how can we work together in a good faith uh, way. Uh, again, not going to get ahead of the President's State of the Union speech. You'll hear from him, uh, and, you know, you'll hear from him talk about optimism, talk about possibilities, which is something that you've heard the President uh, speak to and how optimistic he is uh, for the future of this country. Uh, he'll talk about, you know, the, his economic economic policy and how it's delivered these last two years, and he'll lay out what his what he believe uh, his legislation uh, plan is going to be for the American people. Certainly not going to get ahead of that at this time. And last year, on January 19th, the president had a solo press conference. Does the White House anticipate that there will be a press conference where reporters might be able to ask him about those plans that you just mentioned any time in the near future? I don't have a, a press conference to, to uh, read out to you at this time. Okay. Right, thanks, Karina. Boris Johnson is in town talking about aid to the Ukraine. Is he going to meet with the president or anyone at the White House while he's here? Don't have a, a meeting to read out at this time or on, on the president's schedule with uh, the uh, with Boris Johnson. Thanks, Karina. I have one quick one on documents that went to student loans. Un understanding that you can't tell us why the FBI search of the Biden Center wasn't disclosed previously and that Ian Sams has referred to questions about the National Archives possibly being blocked from sending a press release to DOJ. I understand you can't talk about any of that. Can you assure us that the White House has been and continues to be as transparent as possible, meaning that where there haven't been disclosures, something has prevented that? What I can say is what the President has said many times, and you've seen it in our statements, is that um, we are uh, cooperating fully. Uh, the President and his team is cooperating fully, and we will continue to do that. Uh, and I'll just leave it there. 
On student loans, does the White House believe that the president or administration can continue to use emergency powers after the emergency is over? So providing uh, debt, debt relief or pausing loan payments as it relates to the student loans uh, does not require an ongoing national emergency. Uh, and uh, I just laid, a, laid out for Karen how we see this process and talking about the HEROES Act, which was, uh, which was a, a, a authority that was given to the Secretary of Education through Congress, and that's how we're moving forward there. And uh, look, the emergency end ending doesn't change the legal justification. And here's a couple of things here. There was a national there was a national emergency, as we all know, as we've all lived through it. Millions of borrowers were negatively impacted by the pandemic and faced risk of default on their loans due to that emergency, that national emergency. Congress gave, again, the Secretary of Education uh, the authority to take steps to prevent uh, that harm, and, and he is. And that's how we see the process moving forward. With the HEROES Act, it's the, the portion of the HEROES Act that the Secretary is using is the, the part that needs a national emergency to be able to cancel that debt. So I understand what you're saying. And it was sort of explained in the background call a few weeks ago on this where uh, an official said that the increased authority under national emergency is necessary for the program to be created, but doesn't have to be in effect through the duration of the program. And the reason I'm asking is that interpretation could potentially allow for you know, policy effectuation beyond the emergency. So at, at what point is someone not worse off after a pandemic? How, how are we determining I mean, just getting back to, I guess, the, the, I guess the crust of your question is that we don't need an emergency power to use the HEROES Act. It is, a, it is an authority that was given to the Secretary of Education, and he is using that authority for a time, for a moment, uh, that we believe the American people really need it after these last three years, after dealing with uh, what, what many uh, dealt with, uh, to, uh, dealt with uh, a, a, you know, a national emergency that was to them, right? Something that uh, was caused them harm. And so this is a way to help tens of millions of Americans who need a, a little extra help. And so that's what the Secretary of Education is doing. Does the HEROES Act though require the, the national emergency for the Secretary to use it? The, I, I know we're splitting hairs yeah. here, but what I'm getting at is, Yes, there was a national emergency. Yes, the administration used the HEROES Act because of the national emergency to cancel student debt. And I understand that the position that the administration staked out in the DOJ brief is that it doesn't have to be in effect to do the program. But my, my question I'm getting at is when do you stop being harmed by the pandemic? How are we measuring it? And That's a good question. Look, it's not any, and it's not any, uh, any emergency power. It is again something that the Secretary of Education gets to the Heroes Act is something that is in his purview that he's able to use, an authority that he's able to use, and that's a decision that the Se Secretary of Education is going to make. Uh, as you remember, the debt relief uh, was uh, was was being used at the same time that we were pa that we were going to lift up the pause right for uh, for payments, and so we believe as that was going to happen, we needed to do something to help uh, tens of millions of Americans out there. Again, this is an authority that the Secretary of Education has. It's not just any kind of uh, emergency power. This is a power that was given to the Secretary of Edu Education uh, by Congress uh, that he's using in a way to make sure that uh, Americans out there who, who who have been harmed get a little bit of extra relief. Final point. Okay, I, I, just, I, gotta I, gotta I gotta move on. I gotta move on. I just. I, just really I, I really gotta move on. Wait a minute. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, does the president see the current rate of spending at the federal level as a problem? And if so, what spending cuts would he support? <laughs> I mean, look, we, I just talked about what the president has done the last two years, right, by lowering the deficit, right, cutting the deficit by $1.7 trillion. So yes, so that is something that he took very seriously and took action to make that happen. If you look at the Inflation Reduction Act, the Inflation Reduction Act is going to also lower the deficit uh, by hundreds of billions of dollars. That is important as well. Every piece of policy, he has done it in a really responsible way. Every legislation that has been passed by Congress, that has been led by this president, He's done it in a responsible way. So yes, he thinks it's important to, for him to do his job uh, and the best that he can to really address the deficit. And and I'll add this, uh, I'll add this uh, as well. And I've said this multiple times at this podium today, which is that he is willing. He is willing to work in a bipartisan fashion, uh, in a in a good faith fashion, uh, with anybody from uh, from Congress who's willing to continue that work that he has done. 
to build on that historic record that the president has made. So I'll leave it there. Thanks, everybody. I'll see you tomorrow. Great. Well, the White House let us know what time the McCarthy meeting began. Yeah, we will. Thank you.